Okay, I got a very special guest from my hometown here. Tom Hannigan, President America's Service Now. He's a fellow Canton, Massachusetts resident. He jogs through my neighborhood every morning, although uh, this morning he said he didn't have the greatest jog. Today we're <laughs> here to talk about sales, sales management, and we're going to do it under the umbrella of life as a sales call. So, Tommy, thanks for being here today. Dave, awesome to be here. I really appreciate you, you inviting me in. This, uh, looking forward to our discussion. I am too. And by the way, if you don't accept my LinkedIn invite, I'm gonna I'm gonna not even release this. I, I said so what happened today. <laughs> all right, I'm I, I actually had to rescind it. I was noticing it was sitting out there for a year, and I'm like, you've got questionable characters in your your connection list. I should be one of those questionable characters. I'll send you an invite after today. Anyway. All right, though. I will do that. I'm a big fan of LinkedIn and the fact that we're not connected is a problem. So that will happen today. Okay, good, good. I'm going to count on it. Otherwise, I'm going to run to your house and I'm going to make you accept the invite. I do. All right. So I know you, you know, as 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 a buddy around town, and and uh, but I know you also a you've got a you've got a significant your background in sales goes back years. But before we get into it, tell me a little bit about your role at ServiceNow. Then I want to get back into how you got started into this whole career in the first place. Just just a quick snippet on ServiceNow. I know you're a massive uh, company, but just just a quick one for the audience. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've been at service now coming up on 10 years. Uh, I was blessed, uh, you know, to ask to join the company at, at a perfect time. We went through this massive growth uh, over the last 10 years. Um, when I got there, it was about a $400 million company with about 1,000 employees. And in 10 years, we expanded on that to $10 billion. And now we have 20, we're approaching about 23,000 employees. So, you know, right place, right time, greatest product in the world, greatest culture, uh, and work with some great people, all right, to solve some really cool business problems. And we're we're essentially the the AI platform for for business transformation. That's what we do. We go in, we're a workflow engine, and where there was man when where, where there was manual ways of doing business, all right, we go in and automate those. Uh, we believe that people, uh, you know, in your real life, when you want an Uber, you press a button, right? And the Uber shows up at your door, right? Or like my kids ordering McDonald's at two o'clock in the morning when they came home the other night, they, they hit DoorDash. When we go to work and you want something done, it, all of a sudden it turns into like 50 years ago, archaic, right? It's really difficult to get something fixed or get a, uh, you know, your badge or to get clearance to go, you know, use a certain system. ServiceNow wants to make it like that Uber experience for you at work. So that's what we do. Um, like I said, uh, I get to lead the Americas. That That's obviously the U.S., Canada, and LATAM. Um, and uh, I've been leading that for the last year. Interesting. So you know, and, and we, we, I want to talk about your, your whole your whole background. Just real quick on the on the whole making things easier. I don't know, and I'm sure you see this more than I do because of, because of the nature of the work you do. I'm I'm shocked at how systems with all the technology that exists today, how many of these systems don't talk to one another. You know, you go into a company and it's you get all this information, but nothing connects, nothing makes sense, nothing's easy to access. So I'm, I'm assuming you guys come in and simplify and streamline that whole thing. You just you you just exactly demonstrated exactly what ServiceNow does, right? I'll give you I'll give you a quick use case just so people can understand it. Uh, the easiest one for me is like onboarding. When I onboarded at other at another company a long time ago, right? Uh, you sign your deal, right? And then the day of work, you get your email account. Then maybe like three days later, you'll get your badge, and then maybe two days later after that you'll get your HR benefit system. And then maybe a couple of days after that, uh, as a sales rep, you can connect it to the CRM system and then maybe you'll start working. Maybe at like week two, week three, yeah. right? This is what it's like in a ServiceNow world. Two weeks before you start, your laptop sh shows up at your house, right? You go online, you do all your benefits, right? Um, your badge shows up. You get a link to like, actually, when you walk in the front door of, of your employer, you show, they show you exactly how to walk to the actual desk in your manager's office. Mm. So yeah, you're already connected to your systems because ServiceNow does exactly that. We connect to your CRM system, your HR system, uh, your, your ERP system, and we make the work, we automate the work to make sure that the experience of the employee or the experience of the customer 
is really easy, just like that Uber experience. Yeah, well, I'd like to, I'd like to get a job if you guys are hiring. If you could if you could throw my <laughs> my resume in there. Well, you know, it's it's interesting though. The the first few minutes of any experience really defines the relationship. I mean, if you really think about when you meet somebody for the first time, all the studies show that within seconds you decide who you think that person is, even if you're wrong. So that whole onboarding wel welcoming process is a big deal and. I think gets underestimated because people get busy, companies get busy and they forget how quickly you can lose a new hire, for example, if they're made to feel like they're waiting in line or second fiddle. Right, you nailed it. They're leaving to come to something better. So you want them, A, to feel really good about what they chose, but more importantly, right, we're in sales. We want them to be productive, right? We want them to be ready and rock and roll and get out there seeing customers and feeling really comfortable to go do their job. So it's a balance. Like, yes, you get a happy employee, but you get a very productive employee. Okay. So, yeah, it's it's a really important it's it's a really important time uh, in technology, especially with AI being here, where it can really do some positive things for us. And it, and it gets a bad rap. I mean, I'm I'm probably one to criticize because I'm a I'm not technical. Uh, although I use all this technology, I'm I'm kind of a people first, and then I use the tech as a tool. I don't, I don't view the technology as something that replaces the relationship, but something that might assist it. How do you reconcile that in your world right now? And to what extent is technology maybe being, um, I'm not going to say overrated, but are people overestimating its ability to, to establish and maintain a relationship? Yeah, well, no, relationships are gold. And I, and I tell, I, I feel this is important for both when you're selling to a customer or selling to partners, or like creating relationships in your in your uh, professional network, right? I believe everything is a sales call, and I don't mean to be cheesy like everything's a sales call, but creating relationships that that where there's trust, integrity, people actually like working with you for a reason, right? Because they can trust that they're going to get value out of you and actually have a good time while they're doing it. Yeah. Isn't it? There's no difference in your work life, uh, you work with your friends or talking to a customer, they're all the same. People want to be treated well. They want to trust who they're around. They want to have a little fun along the way, right? Um, like, why not? Why shouldn't it be that easy, right? Because when we all wake up every day, like we spend a ton of time at work. We spend a ton of time at work, at least I do. Um, and why that is easier, I believe easy for me. Sometimes it drives my wife a little crazy. She's like, can you please like, be mid, not being like be a little unhappy today and i'm like no because i'm going to work with the greatest people on the planet we're all on the same page we're all rowing the boat the same way we're all cheering each other on and we're all in it for the right reasons like that's fun to me right whether it's going out playing pickup basketball or, or going to try to close a quarter like all the same things kind of integrate and intertwine um and, and there's no reason why there should that shouldn't be able to happen yeah, well, that's that's who you are. I mean, I, I've I've been around you in a few social settings, not a ton, uh, but I do remember the first time I met you. I won't give all the details, but we were at a Halloween party. I think that was oh, the boy. first. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Oh, it was, it, but there was music on. I think I had hijacked the system and I had put a song on, and for whatever reason, I remember. I don't know what the song was to be honest with you, but for some reason. You jumped up when that song came on, and and I thought to myself, this guy's a fun dude. You were just having a good time. I see you jogging through the neighborhood. You're always happy. I want to view you as a miserable human being, but you're not. You really are a, a motivational, uh, happy dude, and and uh, I think that that probably carries through at work as well. Do, do me a do me a favor, Tom. You grew up uh, in Massachusetts. I think you grew up in Braintree, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So, so just walk me through real quick. What was it like uh, in high school? What your hobbies, interests, maybe part-time jobs? And then ultimately, how did you go from that into your first uh, sales job? I'll let you kind of fill in the blanks there. Sure. So uh, proud Braintree Womp, right? Uh, grew up there, had a great experience. I still have so many great friends um, that still live there that we're very, very tight together. Um, had a great, you know, kind of, whole you know uh school experience there right through high school where you know high school really starts to kind of form who you are i believe um love sports right i played uh soccer and baseball wasn't the greatest athlete in the world loved basketball right wasn't the greatest athlete but always uh was part of a team right maybe not the starter but always like to be part of the team and like be in uh the best practice player the the you know 
earn my time, all that good stuff. So nothing, you know, from a sports perspective ever came easy to me, but I love the competition and I love the teammate part. Mm -hmm. uh, of, um, wasn't the greatest student, uh, but like held my own. Um, went from there, I went to college where I went to St. Anselm's College where uh, you kind of just another step of developing yourself, you know, great small school, kind of like what belonged. It was just kind of fit my personality. Um, met another, when I talk about networks, like I have my high school network, I have my college network, then I have my work network, but all those three networks know each other. Yeah. Right. And over the years, and that's what makes me really happy. But I had an unbelievable experience there. Um, you know, a lot of people that are my cheerleaders to this day are my St. A's gang and we and, and we focus on each other and, and we take care of each other and that network helps us but i think you know uh when i got out of college the 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 job market was horrendous and uh i didn't you know i wasn't one of these people that was like this you know business major i was actually a criminal justice major because i didn't know what i wanted to do right um and yeah i i literally just wanted to get you know my job was to get through college and get a diploma yep. and you know, by the way as I have two children, that's not the methodology I would, you know, prescribe to them, right? I'd be a little more focused on that. So if I look back, if there's things I could have been better, I, I could have put a little more effort into academics and I could have been a little more focused on my career, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I got out of college and it was, was there was just no jobs out there. For one year, I had a st I was applying to any job on the planet, you name it. Uh, I, I remember I kept them. I had a stack of uh, letters that where I didn't get the job. Right. Yeah. And I, they just kept them on, you know, landed, landed on my desk. Um, to give credit to my parents who are the best, you know, blue collar, hardworking family. Uh, I was not allowed to sit around and just, you know, go after jobs. I always had to have a job. I, I did everything from working in warehouses. This is after college mm -hmm. work houses to security guards in a hospital to, you know, and by the way, some of those jobs were you know, my friends helped me get because I was going through a tough period in my life. I needed to make some money, right? Start paying off school loans and doing all that stuff. Um, so after about a year, I was like, I, you know, everything happens for a reason. I had a cousin that worked at Liberty Mutual and she called me up and she's like, Tommy, I think you'd like this. There's a claims adjuster job uh, where I think you, you would fit really in. And that job was great. Um, I got the job. Right. So first I, I got into this professional environment and I could cut, start figuring out the world from that perspective. But number two is the job was uh, as a claims adjuster, I had to go out and anyone that got in a, a car accident or an, an issue from a, a, a Liberty Mutual insurer, I would have to go investigate, use my criminal justice <laughs> skill set, right? But I had to go investigate to figure out whose fault it was. Yep. And the goal of it is within 24 hours, if it was our insurance fault, I would want to go to the person that that was had a claim against us and try to settle the claim, right? And because the, it's long known in the insurance world, if if, uh, if someone that has a claim gets to a lawyer, not, nothing against lawyers, right. but that makes the claim go up, it extends the time, and it gets really costly for the insurance company. I, early on, all I did was cold call people to get in front of them, I had to figure out the situation of who did what. And then I started negotiating with the, the people that would do the claims, or I was negotiating with attorneys on trying to settle claims. Yep. Sounds a lot like a sales call, doesn't it? Yep, absolutely. And it literally, I then getting back to networks, one of my great friends uh, from college, no, from uh, high school, excuse me, called me up and said, hey, Hanny, you know, there's this company called EMC and, and he, he literally was in, he worked up, he, he worked there through college in the, uh, uh, in the uh, kind of, uh, the shipping area mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're offering jobs to like hardworking kids that want to be in sales. And this company is taken off. I couldn't tell you what EMC did forever other than I trusted this person with my life. Yep. And, uh, what he said was, Hey, listen, you know, the great place about this is I've met a lot of the salespeople. If you work hard, if you work harder than anyone else, you can make, you, you can make a lot, a lot of money. And that really intrigued me because what I did find at Liberty Mutual, which was a great job is 
doesn't matter how many claims I'd process, doesn't matter how many you know things I settled. You know, I got paid a salary and they, they pay me fine. But I knew, I knew then that if I would like, I, I want, I like to work hard. I wanted to work really hard and I wanted to get paid for it. And I wanted to control my own destiny, especially from an income perspective. EMC was the launching ground for my sales career. So it's interesting because your, your career is similar to mine in the sense that when I graduated from college, I was lost. I was literally lost working in the restaurant business and part-time jobs and making slush. And uh, it's just, you know, stuff that I'm like, I can't believe I have a college degree and I'm, I don't have a real job in quotes. And then my first, my first foray into a professional sales environment was the mortgage industry. So yeah. s similar, but different, but that, that, that type of uh, experience. But I just remember that was the time in my life where I probably had the least amount of confidence because at the time I thought, okay, got a college degree, I get hired, companies want college kids. Nobody cared. And so you probably felt the same thing coming out of school. School obviously didn't cost then what it does now. I mean, the exponential increase in college tuition compared to what it was then is, is you know, it's outrageous. But anyway, so you, you, you got in. Tell me about the onboarding. Tell me how you got started at EMC. Like what were some of the lessons you learned early that's still apply today. I'm glad you asked because uh, you, you just triggered something. So, you know, another thing I wish I was better at when I was in college was preparing for a job. Not only not knowing what industry I want to be in, but the interview process. And interview process, that means public speaking. That means, you know, expressing your thoughts clearly. That's being articulate, right? So that's, I was not good at that. Matter, matter of fact, I was horrendous at it. And uh, once again, I got my first job. That was great and that helped. But when I went to interview for uh, EMC, my first sales interview there was horrible. And the person called up my friend and said, listen, he was very mediocre. My friend convinced that manager to give me another shot. Hmm. And that's when I learned the, the, the key lesson, right? Once again, everything in life is a sales call, right? An interview is all it is, is a sales call. And then what do you do for a sales call? You prepare, you understand who you're interviewing with and what that company is all about, right? You go in there and you ask them really smart questions about things they're trying to solve. And then you position yourself to solve those and then you close them. So that second time around, second time around, I knew everything of what EMC did. I knew about every product. This is the first time didn't know this so much. I did the old wing it. Right? Then I knew exactly where you know th that interview person, that interviewee. I knew where they went to college. I knew I investigated their network of people that I knew, so I could start setting in references on top of that, right? And then I positioned myself to do all the things that that person wanted to do. And then I really closed, and I used a lot of references outside, you know, outside my network to help close and get that that job. So learned a lot. Ran, learned a lot in that phase. You know, back then there was no LinkedIn. The tools available to us in the in the nineties were virtually non-existent. You were relying on, you know, whatever, whatever might you didn't have a cell phone. So even yet your contacts list. I, there's no such thing as those things. But okay. you had to be creative to somehow bring your worlds together. It's funny you bring this up. This morning I posted a, a silly survey on LinkedIn about where where customers originate from. I took my last 50. I got up at like I don't know, 5.30. I'm like, I got this curiosity. I'm like, where did my last 50 come from? Right. And I, I looked at it, I said, wow, 43% of them were referred to me. 28% come from ongoing relationships, personal and professional. And then, then, then it's networking and speaking and all that stuff. But my, my point is all of these worlds collide to your, which is basically what you described earlier. What I hear a lot of people say, and it's even salespeople, it makes me cringe, is they keep business and personal separate. I get the concept. I get the concept. I don't want to sell anything to my friends. I don't want to do that. But my friends obvious also work in businesses. And I believe it's on me to know what they do. And I'm okay with them knowing what I do because you never know who knows somebody. What's your take on that? And, 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 and do you ever hear people say that with, no, I never mix it. And when, when five o'clock stops, I don't, I don't talk business, you know, and I, and I get why. But what's your take on that whole thing? Well, first of all, maybe 20 years ago, you had the capability of doing that, like at five o'clock it stops. 
in the digital age, the world never stops anymore. Everyone is connected, if you like it or not, right? Everyone has a perspective of who you are before you get on the phone with them or talk to them or meet them in the first place, right? There's not an interview that I get that people don't know like exactly that where I work before and you know they know that or where I went to college or have done something like that anymore. So I think that goes out the window. Uh, number two is your point is when you mix business and pleasure, you don't know you're doing it if you if you're doing it the right way. Meaning, I believe in a relationship, you always have to bring value in that relationship, whether it be a friend or whether it be in business. And if you're bringing someone value, and then you need some currency to ask them for something, it becomes a very easy, easy exercise. And you're not giving value like it's like you put chips in the piggy bank, right? And you know sometimes you'll never ask for them back, but you know what? Every once in a while you do. But if there's integrity and trust and true value that you brought that person, right? Whether it be in your work life or or your personal life, those things usually work themselves out really easy. People want to help each other, right? And I like to surround myself with people that like I want to help and they want to help me. I think at some level you got to be predisposed to give and. Early on in my sales career, I would say I was more of a taker. I hate to admit it, but I had to accomplish whatever goals the company set. So therefore, I had to try to close a deal, get a lead, um, get an introduction. And I always felt dirty about it. There was nothing dishonest about it, but it felt very needy and raw and gross. And so flipping that mindset as the years went on to I'm only going to give and I'm either going to listen, I'm going to be curious, I'm going to help, I'm going to refer, and I don't care if anything comes back. If it doesn't come back, I still did the right thing. I, I don't know, I don't know that that's the, the mindset being instilled in a lot of salespeople today. Where, where, are you, where do you stand on all that? Uh, well, I totally agree, right? Like, if you're just a taker, you will not have consistent success. You'll have success, but you'll look like the heartbeat, right? You'll do great one year, you'll do, you know, you'll have a rough year or a rough couple of years, then you could do great again, right? And as a sales leader, like those people that are not consistent, they drive me crazy. And, you know, I, I kind of don't want them in my business. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I can't speak for the past, but I know, okay, I always ask customers when I, when I meet a customer and I, and I ask them about my sales team, I know when the person says, they bring value to me every time I talk to them, whether it be, hey, it's a seminar, seminar I didn't know about, or um, this other customer is trying to tackle your exact same problem. They're in your same industry. Let me connect you. I won't even be on the call, but let me do that for you because I know I know that will only benefit you. And I think you'd like them. And I think you guys could get, or girls could get something really done. That's cool, right? Those are just two small examples of like bringing value all the time to make everyone kind of rise up and not not take takers you know usually end at the you know it, it's really evident at the end yep. right but because a relationship never goes away we were down the cape last summer and we were sitting around the um i don't know we were in the circle in the sand or whatever oh yeah and um i don't even know how the whole podcasting thing came up but your wife brought up or i brought up smartless i don't even know who brought it up but that's the one memory I have of that day is only talking about the episodes of Smartless and what these guys talked about. And like, I, like to me, it was just feeding my brain. It has nothing to do with business or sales or anything. But I think there's, there's something about sharing ideas that have nothing to do with business that just kind of fill out, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I, I, we would probably be talking anyway. But I just think there's just something about talking about things that have nothing to do with business, if you're interested. Totally agree, and because and, you make a connection with someone. Right. And if you make a connection with someone, then you usually can understand like what's important to them, how they think, and, and, and you know, you can create a positive situation for yourself. Right. right? I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Like knowing people on a personal level, I think it's really important whether it be I ask customers and new new relate new people that I meet personally. I want to know about their families. I want to know about their kids, right? I want to know about you know do they? I'm, I love going to sports games, right? I, I love doing all that type of stuff. I like to golf, right? I like to run. Um, 
I, I'm a girl dad. Like I, I'm fascinated with, you know, how to, you know, elevate women in the workplace. All right. Those are just like, that has nothing to do with work. Right. None of those do. But you know what? I am super interested in anyone who wants to talk to me about those all the time. All right. Well, I couldn't agree more. When I was in my 20s, my first, my second sales job, one of the guys in the office said to me, I was probably 25. He was the top guy in the office. I was struggling. I was just cold calling, you know, not, not having a lot of success, frustrated as hell. And he said to me, I forget his, his exact words, but he said something to the effect of, you're still a single person who just works really hard. Wait till wait five years, wait till you're married, wait till you have kids, wait till you have interests that diversify beyond work and going out on the weekends. You're going to relate to people on such a different level. You've got the DNA to do it. You just need a little bit more time. So I think it kind of ties back into what you're saying. What For you though, you know, it, it, as you think about what you, how, how you got started versus maybe how some of the salespeople are getting started today, what do you look for in people like how do you know they've got the dna to do the job and and what would cause you to say not gonna work yeah uh so first of all i think it's really i and emc instilled this and i and i i am so i am so like i said blessed that i went to the right company for i was very raw i could have been molded a bunch of ways and i got molded in a, you know in the most core classic sales way that you could the people that work the hardest, right? The people that put the most effort in, the people that are good people and do things the right way, the people with integrity will benefit and win, all right? And I am a huge believer, first person in, last person to leave. Mean something. You got to practice, right? You might go in the office, not to actually call, call a customer, but you might be practicing your, your pitch, mm -hmm. right? Stay after work to get the list ready for the next day because that takes that's time that you're not spending that you could be on the phone the next day with customers like little things like that emc pounded into our brains um and and then you know being professionally aggressive to like if you did your homework and and, you, and we knew we had the best product like show up at that door and be ready to sell and ask for the business right and 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 out hustle everyone else on the planet to go do what you had to do like that was ingrained in me day one from cold calling to actually to we went into the field. You know, I learned a ton from that perspective of just like what hard work means. Tom, let me ask you this. I, I see, uh, you know, as the years have gone on, technology has evolved significantly and the, the information available to the average salesperson is it's okay. infinite. It's it's infinite. But. I coach a lot of salespeople and I can tell you different industries, all different industries, although they're well connected online, you know, they've got the, they've got the connections. Most of them don't know anybody. And I only know that because I sh I've shared screens with them. You know, they'll, we'll share say LinkedIn screens and, you know, somebody might have 6,000 connections, 10,000 connections. And as we start to go through them and I said, well, how do you know this individual? Or tell me, it looks like you've been connected to this person for seven years. Tell me how you got, how you met them. There's no knowledge of that. So they, even with all the tools, the lists get automated for them. It's the initiation of the relationship they still still struggle with. They've, they, things are being made easy, but they're still not getting started. I'm not saying that's the way it is at service now, by the way, but what are your observations? As what, what, what causes one salesperson to have all the information and not act and another person to have no information and still make something happen. It's hustle, right? Sometimes I think it's just flat out hustle. Um, but I'll flip it the other way. I go on a lot of sales calls to see executives and I'm with my sales team. And I'll tell you when uh, that's it, the person that we're calling on and my sales rep ask them about their top three initiatives, which is like a staple in the world, how many roll their eyes because all that information is available today. Uh, that was not the case 10 years ago. Yeah. And they roll their eyes because unfortunately sales reps, as you move on your career, you'll move from account to account. So picture yourself being the customer, having, having to tell every salesperson what's important to them. Mm. Like they're busy people. These are executives running huge companies. So 
it's so important, like I said, from a hustle and being just smart perspective to show up on every sales call, knowing everything what that person, like you should be able to find out through social media, through all, all the, the tools, through the people that already called on the person, what is exactly important to that person, what's important to their boss, important to their CEO, important to their company, and come in with a perspective of how you can bring value to them in those key places. So I don't know if I answered your, your question, mm -hmm. but I just think that the people that hustle, that put the customer first, that do their homework, truly understand or try to understand, because you don't have to be perfect. It's all right if you're wrong, but if you come in with a perspective and you can kind of back it up, I would tell you those customers appreciate it immensely. Okay. Tell me if I'm, uh, tell me if I'm unreasonable here. I've got certain pet peeves when it comes to salespeople. I've been, I am one, I've managed them, I've developed them. I also coach a lot of their managers. Um, pet peeves of mine, uh, poor follow-up and follow-through drives me absolutely crazy. Delayed communication, lack of urgency. I lose my mind with that stuff appropriately. It, it, it's like I, I harness it inside, but when I don't see that quality in an individual, I struggle. The other thing I struggle with is those that avoid conflict or bad news. And I always found that when things went wrong, that's when the relationship could elevate. It would either decline or elevate depending on how willing you were to get out in front of it. Where, where do you stand on sense of urgency, follow up and follow through, and then acknowledgement of, of uh, whatever, a problem, getting out in front of a problem, being proactive? Where are you at with that? Yeah. So in a full cust, if you know, customer is always first. If I think about that. They should be treated like that. They should be treated like gold, right? Because they are that like they're the most important part of that relationship. So yes, little things like follow up, but articulated follow up. Like these are the four things we talked about. Mm -hmm. Here are the three things, action items. This is what's going to happen next. Is there anything I missed? Please let me know. And our next meeting is this date. And let's get it in the books now, right? That's execution at every aspect, as opposed to thanks for your time. I'll talk to Cindy. I'll talk to Rob and we'll schedule something, you know, three weeks from now. That does no, like, that's just a drive-by shooting that no, no one, no one, no one, no one created any value. No one cared. No one put the customer first. No one treated the customer like they should. Getting back to your other question, um, in a true customer-centric world where you put the customer first, solving their problems and the problems are when things don't go right is the true currency, it is the true currency. Like at EMC, I learned this early and at ServiceNow, I learned it every day. At EMC, it was it was a storage company. It ran computer storage. Yep. So when, the, when that thing broke, when a storage array broke, literally airlines couldn't book tickets. Right. Banks, ATMs did not work like in those situations. Those people's jobs are on the line because right. they chose EMC, right, for all the right reasons for it not to go down. I was on so many customer service calls in my 23 years at EMC through the weekend because I sold it to them. I'm part of responsible. I told them that would not happen. I was there to garner resources. I was there to buy the pizzas for the people that were working around the clock. I was there just to do anything to show them that through thick or thin, we are together, right? At ServiceNow, it's the same thing. When I meet an executive at ServiceNow, I think partnership is an overused word, right? Partnership is just used too blatantly. True partnership is I give them my cell phone number because I said, I want you to have this because when you have a problem, I want you to call me 24-7. Because that's what I'm putting on the table. That's because I will solve your problems when you need it. We'll talk about selling you something at, at another date, but I am here to solve the problems when you have a problem with the ServiceNow platform. You have to be forward thinking. You have to put the customer first, just like you put your friends first. You put, well, you put your families first, just like anything else in a relationship. Yeah, the, well, the, the relationship is, is, is so critical. I see a lot of salespeople, they go in and they're talking about a product or a service to the customer and they have no idea that the customer is looking at them from the lens of, you have no idea who I am. You're, you're only here to talk to me about that. You don't understand me. You don't understand my business. You don't understand that I have a meeting in 10 minutes. Um, you don't understand that I'm still pissed off that you guys screwed something up two years ago. You, you know what I'm saying? 
I, I wonder how often the product or the service gets in the way of, of, of having a, a credible relationship with somebody. You, you know, when you were telling me this, I, I was thinking our, my CEO today is Bill McDermott. He, you know, he is, you know, the, he is the 800 pound gorilla of enterprise software. He's built businesses, but he was a sales guy. He grew mm -hmm. up as a sales guy. He's our CEO. And when, when my customers interact with him, right, which he does all the time, he wants to be in front of our customers all the time. When that meeting is over, within two hours, within two hours, the email goes out talking about everything that was in that meeting, what was going to happen next. That's our CEO, mm -hmm. right? If he can operate within a two-hour uh, limit, right, why can't a sales rep, why can't I be operating within an hour? He has a lot more on his plate. Right. That's how you take that to a customer. You take that to an interview. When you're in an interview process, you take that to anything. Like follow up is so so important. What's the most challenging part of you know? You went from salesperson to management. Now you run the whole show in the Americas. What's the most challenging part as a sales leader trying to move a sales organization forward? What's the hardest part of that? Uh, two things. First of all, the first thing that I've learned uh, in a long time of managing people, like finding great talent and, and keeping them and, and finding ways to create more talent to come easier to you, right? And put them in a position for success. Like the team with the best people went in sales. It's period, end stop. There's nothing else that goes on. The best people win all the time. So surrounding you with great people is is paramount. Two is taking those people and getting them comfortable with change, right? Because that's the key. What just think about two year, two and a half years ago, we were in the COVID, right? Think about how we had to change and talk to our customers and be online and still deliver, right? And now we're back in the office and now the customers are back in the office and, and the world's going a hundred miles an hour. Those are just getting a sales organization and your people to change that quickly and be on point and be on with you and, and feel good about it is, is, is the trickiest thing to do. Um, but it's, it's also one of the funnest things to do. You talked about Bill as the CEO, still doing the very things that he might expect an entry level salespeople to do because he believes in doing these things. He believes in that, that that's part of developing the relationship. Quick, every, and this is another testament. Like this is why I love service now, our culture. So, uh, you have Bill as the CEO and then our whole, his whole executive team, meaning my boss, the chief revenue officer, our CEO, CFO, every one of those people are salespeople. They, they spend more than half their time talking to customers, solving problems with the sales team, creating a team atmosphere. We're all together. That doesn't happen. He, it is a requirement to work in service now that, you know, putting the customer first, we our job's there to sell them and support them. Everyone in the company, I don't care if you're a data entry person or you're the CFO of our company, you're in to make sure that experience with the customer is unbelievable and put ourselves in a situation to, to, you know, to create a long-term relationship. And, and I might be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong with this. I read, I read book, Bill's book, I'm gonna guess 13 years ago. I don't remember when it was, 10, 12, 13 years ago. He came out of Xerox, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yep. Right. So he got that hardcore, you know, these are your two streets in Manhattan. These are the prospects you're going to go after. And he still very much, it sounds to me, lives that today, that same basic discipline, principled way of doing things. 100%. 100%. <laughs> like he, he'll ask at the end of a quarter, like, do you have that? Do you have your customer's cell phone number? Are you connected? Do you have a relationship that you can text them? because we built a relationship because we got to get business done in a certain period of time, right? Like that's something our CEO is asking for, yeah. right? And I believe it because that's what a true relationship is. If some, if you're in a texting relationship with your customer that you can text them at any time, you have now created the bridge of, of true partnership, true partnership. There's a lot of hesitation around asking and leveraging text and, and maybe because the perception is I haven't earned it yet or I don't want to bother this person. I don't want to abuse the relationship. There's an art to a relationship, right? I mean, so like here you are, you're in charge, but you'd be willing for whatever reason. And it was a mistake. You shared cell phones with me, but 
but let's just pretend you didn't know. Okay. But at the end of the day, I have I do not have a C level contact that I've done business with that hasn't willingly given me their cell phone number. It's just it's just the way you do business right now. So I think it's a it's a miss not to do that. But what about also data reporting, um, account planning, whether it's formal or informal? I see a lot of sales organizations struggle to implement and and execute these things because it, it, it gets bucketed as micromanagement. And all I see it as is you're, you're, you're creating visibility into your tendencies, into your trends, into your, you know, uh, your, your viewpoint into the customer. That's where I see a lot of sales leaders slip where they don't do it or they have trouble getting the team to do it because the team says, oh, here we go micromanaging me now i'm not important right. where do you what's your perspective on all that well you're right we have more tools than we ever had before there's more data real-time data to make good decisions right but I, I take it from a perspective remember i hope i've been really consistent here when any interaction if you're not bringing value to my rep or my customer then what good is that data so if i if i do an inspection with my rep and I use the data in a format that makes that person feel awful or feel inadequate or like I'm, you know, beating them down. I didn't improve. I didn't improve my relationship. And I certainly didn't move the business uh, forward in any, in any way. But if I approach that rep as, hey, here's the data. This is what I see. And all this green over here is good. Like, look at what you're doing here. But this red, I use a phrase at service now. Let's hug the red. Meaning... You don't get in trouble for a data point being a red, but let's look at that situation, what's wrong, and then let's garner resources to that person to go help them fix that problem so they can go accomplish what they want, right? There's, there's no difference than taking that same approach with a customer, right? Hey, I see that you haven't done all the right upgrades, right? That will put you at risk or maybe that do this. Like, I'm here to tell you, like, we need to take a different approach here and we need to be proactive about that. If you're proactive with that, take risk away from their world, why wouldn't they want to kind of partner with you on the next situation? So I think if you use it as a tool to take, hey, always, you have to start, like people working the tails off. Like, you have to respect it and you, you have to let people know you appreciate it, but then make sure that you use data in a form that you can give them feedback to help them and then get them resources to, to do things that, uh, that will help them, you know, overachieve. Okay, I know you have to go for, for another call. So I just have one more question on data, then we, we can wrap it up. The uh, as it relates to say data from your seat, you, you can't be with every rep, you can't be with every manager, you get things pulling you in all different directions. How do you determine the health and wellness of the business in the moment? Do you pull up a dashboard of some sort and then beyond revenue say, what are you looking at that tells you we're in good shape or we've got a problem? Yeah. So I am, uh, you know, I am every, very data specific. I like a lot of data. I'm, I'm, I'm a big operational command person. And a lot of people roll their eyes or a lot of reps roll that. But for me, if, if a manager is operationally sound and a rep is operationally sound, they, if they do that, they are very consistent. And when they're very consistent, they're very successful. People that aren't operationally sound are very up and down and that that's no way to run a business right for yourself or anyone else so i like to from a sales perspective right i like to understand pipeline i like to understand how mature that pipeline is so there's situations we have tons of pipeline but it's not mature We're, right that's not a healthy business there's right. situations we don't have enough pipeline but it's super mature well those are two different things that you're going to handle in that quarter a different way all right so I like to kind of have the balance of that. And then as we all are in sales and we're all trying to make life easier for everyone, I'm a big believer in linearity, doing all your business at the end of a month and then the quarter is super unhealthy. Yep. I also believe as you roll into a next quarter, like the game plan should already be there. You shouldn't be creating it on the on a flywheel. And when you do that, it just creates so much, much work, so much more stress, so much more churn. You know, if you can kind of get good at all those things, creating nice, mature pipeline, two, three quarters out, cultivating that and, and not getting stuck in the moment, that's what really good reps and managers do uh, 
They, they look at it over two, three, four quarter period, and they run great businesses. How does data help you or, or, a, or a manager on your team have objective conversations with people that might be struggling? A couple things. Um, I think in a data driven conversation, it's, it's, it, you can't kind of hide from the facts. All right. But that's part of, that's part of developing people. So I'd rather get to a point that we could both agree that, Hey, here's a problem. The data is showing it. We could debate the data, but 90% of the time the data is correct. Right. Or 80% of the time the data is correct. It gives you have a platform. Once again, no one's in trouble. Let's under, let's like look into the data and find out what's going on so we can fix it. And I think people that go in with a fix it attitude, instead of telling people, Hey, you know, that piece of data is awful. You, you stink, you're awful. You know, you, you, you need to work hard. You, you need to work harder. That that's not a way of making someone better, like digging in the data and figuring out what they can do differently to solve for that. I think that unlocks data and you're using it for the right way. It's, it's really important because people, you know, people can get lost in the data also. If there's one piece of advice you would give to a sales manager, a salesperson, this whole concept of life as a sales call, what's one thing that everybody should be doing no matter what in a non-negotiable way to succeed in sales in 2024 and beyond? Yeah, I mean, I, I it gets back to a lot of things I was talking about. It was not one thing, but I think, you know, creating networks of, of people, right? where you give out more than you take back that you can leverage to help you in both your personal and professional life. That is really smart, especially if you're younger, right? Building those professional networks and, 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 and integrating those into your life. And like I said, the more you put out, the more stuff you put in the piggy bank gives you the, the capability of asking for something in return instead of what you talked about earlier of just asking for something. Right. So if you can do that, um, for keys, this is a bunch of stuff for, for sales reps, you know, use the data, show up with a perspective, do your homework, be the first person in, put the customer always first, and then invest in yourself, whether it be public speaking or negotiating. Like it is, it's like being in a team sport. You always can, you know, work on your craft to get better. And those people that do all those things can have a really good, you know, have a great, have a great career in sales. Cause there's nothing like it, right? What better job in the world that you can create? Like you have control over being super successful or not, right? You have control over how much money you make, you know, how many people want to be in that position, right? It, it, it is truly the coolest job on the planet. Tommy Hannigan. Thank you so much for taking the time with me. It was great. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, man. I'll see you soon. Take care. All right, take care.